the objective of this lecture is to provide the second part of the study of non-coplanar impulsive orbital transfer. This lecture focuses on the development of impulses that change both the orbital plane and the orbital energy. Using this type of impulse, a non-coplanar two-impulse transfer between circular orbits called a Hohmann type transfer is developed. This lecture is divided into the following parts. First, an impulse is developed that changes both the orbital plane and the orbital energy. Then, using the impulse developed in part one, a two impulse orbital transfer between non coplanar circular orbits is developed. This two impulse transfer is referred to as a Hohmann type transfer. And it's because it has a structure similar to a Hohmann transfer, except for it's a non coplanar transfer. And it has the following features, which are that the transfer starts and terminates along the line of intersection between the two orbits. And it also has the feature that the plane change is performed entirely at the apoapsis of the transfer orbit. Now, as will be seen in this lecture, we will discuss why the plane change should be performed at the apoapsis of the transfer orbit, and that will actually be included in part one of the lecture, where we actually describe this impulse that changes both the orbital plane and the orbital energy as to why it's more effective to change the orbital plane at the apoapsis of an orbit than it is to change the orbital plane at any other point on the orbit. So now let's start with the first part of the lecture. So in this first part of the lecture, we are going to develop an impulse that changes both the orbit plane and the orbital energy. Now recall a cranking impulse. So let's review a cranking impulse first. A cranking impulse changes the orbit plane but does not change the orbital energy. 
And the reason that the orbital energy is not changed is because for a cranking impulse, the magnitude of the inertial velocity before and after the impulse is the same. So in other words, the inertial speed before and after the impulse is applied is the same. And the angle, of course, was referred to as the cranking angle. So we had that VI minus in magnitude was equal to VI plus, which was just referred to as V for a crank or a cranking impulse. Now, suppose instead of just doing a, a change of the plane, we actually wanted to change the energy as well. So suppose that it is of interest to apply an impulse delta VI that changes both the orbital plane and the orbital energy. So what would such an impulse look like? So an impulse that changes both the orbital plane and the orbital energy would look schematically as follows. So this is an orbital plane change orbital energy change impulse. So first of all, unlike a cranking impulse, an impulse of this kind would be such that the inertial velocity before the impulse is applied and the inertial velocity after the impulse is applied would not have the same magnitude. So schematically, the impulse looks similar to what we have before, except for you notice now that the value of VI minus in magnitude is not equal to the value of VI plus in magnitude. So this means that because the these two these two speeds are different, then that implies that the energy must change. Now, in addition to the, to the fact that the energy has changed, we also have that the plane has changed because we still have a cranking angle, theta. So theta is still the cranking angle, but now it's not a pure crank. It's a crank plus a change in the orbital energy. So what we're going to do is we're going to refer to these things a little bit different from the way that we did it previously, which is we'll say that let VI minus or V minus equal the magnitude of VI minus. And we're going to say V plus is equal to the magnitude of VI plus. So these are the two speeds before and after the impulse is applied and they're the inertial speeds. So if you look at the diagram, we can actually see that if we let the uh, magnitude of delta VI be just delta V, that's equal to the magnitude of delta VI, we can actually use the law of cosines to be able to determine for us the value of delta VI in terms of V minus and V plus. So we then have that delta V squared has to equal V minus squared plus V plus squared minus two times V minus times V plus times the cosine of the cranking angle. And of course that arises because again, if you look at the diagram, you'll see that 
the angle theta is opposite the vector delta vi and vi minus and vi plus are the two inertial velocities before and after the impulse is applied. So this just comes directly from the law of cosines. Now, we actually can use this information to be able to figure out uh, where it's actually most effective to be able to change the orbital plane. So it is known that the speed on an orbit is largest at periapsis and is smallest at apoapsis. So as a result, it's more effective in terms of using less delta V to perform the plane change at apoapsis. And that's because in order to rotate a smaller velocity is easier than having to rotate a larger velocity. So we can actually think of it that way too. It's the equivalently saying that rotating a smaller velocity requires less delta V when compared with rotating a larger velocity. So it's always advantageous to apply a crank and an energy change at apoapsis as compared to applying it at periapsis. So therefore, applying an orbital plane change and energy change requires less delta V when the impulse is applied at apoapsis when compared with applying the impulse anywhere else on the orbit. So consider now a two impulse orbital transfer between non-coplanar circular orbits. Now this transfer schematically looks as follows. We have an initial orbit 
which is circular, and its radius is r1. We have a final orbit, which is also circular, and its radius is r2. Now, in order to be able to transfer between these two orbits, we can't start the transfer just anywhere we feel like. We have to start the transfer in such a way that when we leave the first orbit, it is such that that transfer actually intersects, that transfer orbit intersects the second orbit. So schematically, there's a line. I'm going to call this line L, and I'm going to define all these things a little bit later in quantitatively, but right now I'm going to call this direction L. L is what's referred to as the line of intersection. And what that line of intersection is, is it's a line such that if I apply the first impulse, which I'm going to apply the first impulse, and remember the first impulse is one that takes me from the periapsis of the transfer orbit to the apoapsis of the, of the uh, transfer orbit. So it takes me around to the other side here. Now this first impulse, if I just refer to it as delta V1, it's delta V1. Now it's such that when I get halfway around on this transfer orbit, here's the transfer orbit. I start at periapsis of the transfer orbit and I end at apoapsis of the transfer orbit. So this direction that I'm that that I'm pointed position wise when I'm all done is negative L because L was defined as the line of intersection. So negative L is the negative of the line of intersection. And then the second impulse is one that I apply in order to put me into the final orbit. Now, as I said, I can do the plane change either at periapsis or at apoapsis, but as we just got through discussing, it's, it's going to use less delta V if I do the plane change at apoapsis. So because the second impulse is going to be applied at the apoapsis of the transfer orbit, this is where the plane change is performed. So the plane change is performed by delta V2. And so none of the plane change is going to be done by the first impulse. It's going to be done purely by the second impulse. And we're going to get into the details now of how this actually works by drawing a more elaborate picture than the one shown here so we can see how to actually get these two impulses, figure out what these two impulses are, figure out where exactly they're going to be applied and how to, how to solve for the two impulse transfer as a result. So this two impulse non-coplanar orbital transfer between circular orbits is referred to as a Hohmann type transfer. And it's called a Hohmann type transfer because it has a lot of similarities to a Hohmann transfer except for it's a non-coplanar transfer. So this is what's called a Hohmann type transfer. Now, the Hohmann type transfer, going into more details, has the following structure. So we have this initial orbit, which is an orbit, circular orbit of size R1. We have the final orbit, or the terminal orbit, which is a circular orbit of size R2. So radius of the first orbit is R1, radius of the second orbit is R2. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the two specific angular momenta. The first specific angular momentum is H1i. That's the specific angular momentum corresponding to the initial orbit. The second specific angular momentum is H2i, and that corresponds to the second orbit. Now we know that the angle between these two angular momenta, that angle is the cranking angle. And of course, the direction of each of these two angular momenta from the direction iz those two angles are the orbital inclinations. So this is the orbital inclination for the first orbit, and then the angle between Iz and H2, that's the orbital inclination for the second orbit. So now we have everything 
that we need to start this process. Now remember I said that L was equal to the line of intersection. Now if it's the line of intersection, it's the line of intersection between the two orbits. Now what line is common to both orbits? Well let's think about this. Well we know that that line has to be in the orbit plane of the first orbit and it has to be in the orbit plane of the second orbit. So L must be or must lie in the orbital plane of both orbits. So both the initial and terminal orbits. Well, what would be a direction that would lie in the orbital plane of both orbits? Well, if it's if it's got to be in the orbit plane of the first orbit and it's got to be in the orbit plane of the second orbit, the vector that actually has that's common is the one that is in the direction of the cross product of the two angular momenta. So L is in the direction of h1i crossed with h2i. And if you think about it, that makes sense because h1i crossed with h2i is orthogonal to both h1 and h2. And we know that the line of intersection has to be the line of intersection between the two orbits and it has to lie in the orbital plane of the first orbit and it has to lie in the orbital plane of the second orbit. And that direction, which is in the direction of h1 crossed with h2, is in fact a vector that lies in the orbital plane of both orbits. So we know that we have to start the transfer in that direction. So that the whatever the position is of the spacecraft, it has to be on that line when we start the transfer. So the transfer has to start at this point, which I've labeled right there. This is the start of the transfer. And it has to be along that line of intersection. Now by that same sort of sort of logic, we wind up with this point where we have to apply the second impulse because it's got to be at the apoapsis of the transfer orbit. So this point, which I've labeled up at the top here, this is the terminus of the transfer. And the orbit that takes me between these two, which I'll label with a different color, just so that we're not using the same color I'm going to I'll use a red type color to be able to do this. That is the transfer orbit. Now using that information, we are going to determine the two impulses of the Hohmann type transfer. So these are the two impulses of the Hohmann type transfer. So in order to get started, let's recall that the two orbits are as follows. So the initial orbit is circular with radius r1. The terminal orbit is also circular with radius r2. Now, although it can be done either way, we're just going to assume here that 
R2 is greater than R1, so we're going from a smaller orbit to a larger orbit. Now given that, we know the following. So we know that the speed before the first impulse is applied has to equal the square root of mu over R1. We also know that the speed after the first impulse is applied has to equal the square root of mu times the square root of 2 over r1 minus 1 over a, where a is the semi-major axis of the transfer orbit. And I'll write all that down in just a minute. We also know that v2 minus has to equal the square root of mu times the square root of 2 over r2 minus 1 over a, because when we are at the end of the elliptic transfer orbit, we're at a radius, a distance r2 from the center of the planet. And then v2 plus has to equal the square root of mu over r2. And as I said, I'm going to write this down, where a is equal to r1 plus r2 over 2, which is the semi-major axis of the transfer orbit. Now, these are only the speeds. We need the directions of these of these different velocities. So we need we need velocity because the transfer is non-coplanar. So what we need is we need actually u1 minus and u1 plus, where those are the directions of the velocity before and after the first impulse, and we need u2 minus and we need u2 plus, which we're going to figure out now. So now v1 minus i is equal to v1 minus speed times u1 minus where u1 minus is the direction of the velocity before the first impulse is applied. v1 plus i is equal to v1 plus times u1 plus. Similarly, v2 minus i is equal to the speed v2 minus times u2 minus. And finally, v2 plus i is equal to v2 plus times u2 plus. So we're going to determine these four unit vectors which are associated with the directions of the velocities before and after the impulse is applied. So first, obtain an expression for the line of intersection L. So we know that L lies in the direction of H1I crossed with H2I. So that implies that L has to equal H1I crossed with H2I all divided by the magnitude of h1i crossed with h2i. So that gives us the line of intersection. Now we have that direction of intersection or that line of intersection and we can use it to figure out these four directions u1 minus u1 plus u2 minus and u2 plus. So first we know that u1 minus lies in the direction of h1i crossed with l. And that's because h1i is normal to the orbit plane. l 
is the direction along the position of the uh, where, where the orbit transfer starts. That's that's the line of intersection, and we know that the direction orthogonal to both h1 and l in the right-handed sense has to be the direction of the uh, of the velocity before the first impulse is applied. So that means that u1 minus equals h1i crossed with l all divided by the magnitude of h1i crossed with l. Now because h1i and l are orthogonal, h1i crossed with l in magnitude can just be reduced to the following. We get h1i crossed with l all divided by the magnitude of h1i times the magnitude of l. But the magnitude of l is just 1, so this gives h1i crossed with l all divided by the magnitude of h1i. So that is the direction u1 minus. So next, because no plane change is performed by delta v1, we have that u1 plus has to equal u1 minus. So that implies that v1 minus i equals v1 minus in speed times u1 minus and v1 plus i which is equal to v1 plus times u1 plus has to equal v1 plus times u1 minus. So for simplicity let u1 equal u1 minus which is equal to u1 plus because they're the same thing. So as a result we get v1 minus i is equal to the speed v1 minus times u1 and we get v1 plus i is equal to the speed v1 plus times u1 from which we actually obtain delta v1 i. It's equal to the speed v1 plus minus the speed v1 minus times u1. That's the first delta v. Now we're going to do the same thing for the second delta v. So if you look back at the diagram, you'll actually recall that the second impulse is applied along the negative line of intersection. So now delta v2i is applied at the point minus r2 times l. It's on the negative line of intersection. So as a result, we know that delta V2i has to be in a direction that is nominally opposite the direction of delta V1, but there's also an inclination change associated with it. So it's, it's a little more complicated than that. So now we're going to go through and we're going to figure out delta V2 using the two velocities, V2 minus and V2 plus, and we're going to figure those out right now. So because delta v2i is applied along negative l, we know that u2 minus lies in the direction of h 1i crossed with minus l. It's got to be in the exact opposite direction 
from the direction along with along which uh, u u1 lies so that means that u2 minus has to equal h1i crossed with minus l divided by the magnitude of h1i crossed with minus l but of course this can be reduced to the following expression u2 minus is equal to minus i can factor out the negative sign i've got h1i crossed with l and then divided by the magnitude of h1i times the magnitude of l because the negative sign goes away when i'm taking the magnitude and that gives minus h1i crossed with l all divided by the magnitude of h1i so that's u2 minus but u2 plus is a little bit more complicated than that so next we know that u2 plus lies along the direction of h2i crossed with minus l and that's just because after we apply the delta v we've got to be in the direction such that we're tangent to the final orbit so as a result we get that u2 plus has to equal h2i crossed with minus l divided by the magnitude of h2i crossed with minus l and if we go through a similar process to what we did before we get minus h2i crossed with l all divided by the magnitude of h2i it's because the magnitude of l again is one so that gives us those two directions u2 minus and u2 plus so then we have v2 minus i equals the speed v2 minus times u2 minus and v2 plus i equals the speed v2 plus times u2 plus which gives our second impulse delta v2 i equals v2 plus i minus v2 minus i which is equal to v2 plus times u2 plus minus v2 minus times u2 minus now because u2 plus and u2 minus are not in the same direction that's as far as we can go with that calculation that's that's it so we actually now have the two impulses and we can actually figure this out also in terms of the cranking angle so we know that the cranking angle theta if you want to say cosine of theta if we want to do it first is equal to h1i dotted with h2i all divided by the magnitude of h1i times the magnitude of h2i so that gives that the cranking angle theta is equal to the inverse cosine of h1i dotted with h2i all divided by the magnitude of h1i times the magnitude of h2i and that's the cranking angle So now let's visualize the second impulse because it's the one that has the plane change so it's the more the more uh, complicated one to look at so we know that on this transfer orbit and I'm only going to draw the transfer orbit now on the transfer orbit we have delta v1 which is applied 
in order to raise the apoapsis. Now delta V2, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark this with, with a different color again to be able to see this a little bit better. Now what we have is we have the velocity just prior to the uh, application of the second impulse and I'm going to call that V2 minus I which is what I called it before and then we have the velocity afterwards so this is V2 plus I now the angle between these two is the cranking angle so this is the angle theta so if you look at this again from sort of a side view you have V2 minus and you have V2 plus. Now you can see that this is the same thing that I did at the beginning of the lecture where we have an energy change and an orbit plane change and this angle is the cranking angle theta. So as a result of this diagram which is essentially the same as the diagram I drew at the beginning of of the uh, lecture we have that the uh, the delta V is this delta V right here. So this is delta V2I. And so that we know from this that the magnitude of delta V2I, which is equal to the magnitude of V2 plus I minus V2 minus I, gives us the following result, which gives us delta V2 squared is equal to V2 minus squared plus V2 plus squared minus 2 times V2 minus times V2 plus times the cosine of the cranking angle. So that gives us everything now that we need in order to complete this two impulse Hohmann type transfer. So then the two impulses of the Hohmann type transfer are given as follows. The first one is delta V1i is equal to V1 plus i minus V1 minus I, which is equal to V1 the speed, V1 plus times U1 plus minus V1 minus times U1 minus, but because U1 plus and U1 minus are the same, that gives that delta V1I is equal to V1 plus minus V1 minus times u1, which further implies that the magnitude delta v1, which is the magnitude of delta v1i, is equal to the absolute value of v1 plus minus v1 minus. Now assuming we're going to a larger orbit, v1 plus minus v1 minus is actually greater than zero, but I'm going to leave it as an absolute value because it'll work then regardless of whether you're going from a smaller orbit to a larger orbit or from a larger orbit to a smaller orbit. And also, we have that delta V2i is equal to V2 plus i minus V2 minus i, which is equal to V2 plus times U2 plus minus V2 minus times u2 minus. But it turns out that u2 plus and u2 minus are not in the same direction, so we can't simply combine any terms there, but we can just leave it in this particular form and we get delta v2, which is equal to the magnitude of delta v2i, is equal to the square root of v2 minus squared plus v2 plus squared minus 2 v2 minus v2 plus times the cosine of 
the cranking angle. And that equation just comes from what we had derived previously, except for previously I derived this, it as a square, so I just took the square root of the whole thing. And now we have the two delta v's for the, uh, the Hohmann type transfer. The first one here, that's the first delta v. The second one is this delta v right here. And that gives us the structure of the, of the two impulses. So now let's visualize the entire transfer. So this is a visualization of the two impulse Hohmann type transfer. And again, remember, this is a transfer between two non-coplanar circular orbits. So to start off the diagram, here's the initial orbit, and here's the final orbit. Now, we have two angular momenta. The first angular momentum, specific angular momentum, is associated with the initial orbit. The second angular momentum is associated with the second orbit. The angle between these angular momenta is the cranking angle, which is the angle theta. Of course, these two angular momenta themselves both lead to the initial orbital inclination and the final orbital inclination. Now, using that information, we construct the line of intersection. So remember, the line of intersection is a direction that's common to both orbits. And it was constructed based on the cross product of h1 with h2. So this line of intersection is equal to h1i crossed with h2i, all divided by the magnitude of h1i crossed with h2i. And the first impulse is applied on the line of intersection. I'm going to label the first impulse location with a blue dot. Now the vector from the center of the planet to, or from the focus to that point, that position is equal to R1 times L because the radius of the initial orbit is R1 and the line of intersection is L. And then delta V1 is subsequently applied. So delta V1 is applied in order to raise the apoapsis of, that, of the orbit to put you onto the transfer orbit. Now, once you're on the transfer orbit, the transfer orbit takes you to the other side. So I'm going to label the other side first, because I think it's a little easier if we know where we're ending up first. So here is the other side, which is on the negative line of intersection. So we're going to end up after this half ellipse on the negative line of intersection. And we're going to transfer from periapsis to apoapsis to get us to that point. So now we are at that at that second at that second point. <clears throat> now what happens is that once we get there, we're at the apoapsis of the transfer orbit. Remember that this orbit right here, this is the transfer orbit. Once we get to the apoapsis of the transfer orbit, we apply the second impulse. So the second delta V is in a direction that is hard to draw until I actually draw the two velocities. So first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw the, draw the velocities because it's easier to visualize the impulse once the velocities have been drawn than it is to, than it is to do it before. So here, this direction here, is v2 minus i. This direction, which I'm going to exaggerate a little bit just because I want to I want to make it clear what direction I'm talking about. This direction right here, that vector, 
is v2 plus i. So the vector that connects v2 minus i to v2 plus i, that vector right there, that's delta v2 i. And the angle between v2 minus i and v2 plus i, just for completeness, I'll draw it again. Here's v2 minus i, and here's v2 plus i. And this angle, as I had drawn previously, it's the same angle. This angle is the cranking angle, which is the same angle between the two specific angular momenta. And the magnitudes of these two impulses are what have been derived. And the transfer orbit is a half ellipse. That's why it's called a Hohmann type transfer, because this is a half ellipse. So the transfer time is the same as the transfer time would be for a, uh, for a Hohmann transfer. And the semi-major axis of the transfer orbit is equal to R1 plus R2 all divided by 2. And the second impulse, which is the last thing that I need to just clarify here, the second impulse is applied at this point, which is this blue, blue dot. And that distance, or that position, is right here. And that position is minus R2 times L. So just for completeness, R1 times L is the position where delta V1 is applied. And minus R2 times L is the position where delta V2 is applied. And that is the entire process for the Hohmann type transfer. So this lecture can be summarized as follows. First, an impulse was derived where both the orbital plane and the orbital energy were changed. And then using this impulse, a two impulse orbital transfer between non-coplanar circular orbits was developed. Now the key features of this orbital transfer were as follows. First, is that the first impulse performed no plane change. So another way of saying that is that all plane change was performed by the second impulse. And equally important is that the orbit transfer starts on the line of intersection between the two orbits. And the orbital transfer terminates
negative of the line of intersection between the two orbits. And this type of transfer can be used as the basis for many types of coplanar and non-coplanar impulsive orbital transfer. So if you don't have any plane change, then you don't have to worry about the cranking angle and you just reduce down to a Hohmann transfer. But if you do have a plane change, you can perform the plane change at a place where it's, it's efficient to do so, where it reduces the delta V, which in turn reduces the amount of fuel consumed. And you could potentially put together a more complex orbital transfer by using two impulse orbital transfers repeatedly in order to change the size of the of the orbit and in, in turn change the uh, orbital energy and also change the inclination. But this is the basic orbit transfer which allows you to be able to do those types of maneuvers just for and 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 do this type of transfer for just for just two impulses which is what we developed in this particular lecture so we're gonna end this lecture right here and we'll pick it up with uh with some some other orbital transfer studies in the future